This document will present the verbal story prototype of the Taino, narrated from the accounts of the ancestors of the early Paleo-Siberian Boricua all the way to their most recent. This story is a prototype creation of the combination of the verbal, genetic, and anthropological histories of the native Boricua from Puerto Rico and should only be viewed for entertainment purposes only and not a legitimate account of factual history. That being said, I created this story to dive into the forgotten past of the Boricua from the point of view of peoples who would have survived to tell the tale and to have a taste and a feel of what things would their story say if their story would have been written by ancient Boricua. This is part one of the Boricua document and it reads as follows. The Boricua Record When I was seven it came to pass. The time when my people's life changed forever. At the time I didn't understand much, but we were a group of tribes closely related. Some from other tribes were considered as family like cousins. There were so many of us. I had a best friend from the tribe just up north to us. She was my same age. Her name was Cuba. I remember her smile was contagious. Cuba could light a room with joy and laughter. We would meet along with all our families at the big centers of trade. We ate goats, lambs, cattle, and an array of things like bread from wheat. We were spiritual and had many festivals. The next morning, we couldn't find my father, mother, and I. The town was in chaos, and the peoples were trying to run towards the coasts, but they were all eventually detained. It was these huge warrior men that began to attack all my tribes at the same time in all parts of our land. The next thing we knew, we were all taken captive just northeast, not too far from our lands. We stopped at the place these monsters called home. It was right next to the seas northeast and the ice land just north of that. The monster and his men, I now come to know as Ken, was ordered to follow us further into the lands that we were suddenly exiled to. But Ken had other plans. Instead of letting us go freely, he stayed with us and made us his slaves. My mother, who was 21 years of age, was picked to be a wife for Ken. Ken later targeted most of the children, as specifically boys, because they were a threat to him. When it was my turn to go, even as a child, I saw how he treated the wives he picked. After taking the boys out, he proceeded to grab the women by the hair and place them in a line of tied women. It seemed along the way, Ken and my mother already had some sort of history and wanted to make my mother his queen amongst his women. My mother was simple, but she was the most beautiful unmatched woman of my tribe. I was said, when Ken came toward me, I knew it was my turn to go. So I ran with all my rage and tackled Ken. I only ended up crashing my face onto his knees. I stand up and Ken towered probably four to five times the height of my own. He only seemed to get angrier, but he seemingly praised my bravery with a nod and from the sounds of his language before kicking my head so hard that I instantly started bleeding from the forehead. He grabs his massive spear and before he is able to pierce me like he did to all those boys, my mother jumps on me and covers me looking at Ken, who is about to pierce me with the spear. I pass out. The next thing I know is I'm still alive and that I have been in a critical condition for a few weeks. I don't remember much. Everything went black and every time I would wake up, I had an unbearable pain in my head. I later realized Ken and his men were who killed my father when the men rebelled against them. Apparently, my mother saved my life. I was told that before I passed out, she gambled her own life so I would survive. She was the only woman brave enough to bargain with him. She knew he wanted her. She told him, let my son live as your slave and I'll also offer you my romance as your queen as well. Before we ever got skewered by him, Ken agreed to my mother's terms. This was the beginning of my pure hatred for Ken and his men. But after attacking him, I began to fear Ken as well. After seeing how useless I truly would be against such a big warrior, we then reach a village where they serve Ken, and Ken leaves with more concubines. This was east of where we originally were. But now, we were headed towards the north, where there was so much snow and ice. We acquired animal skin for cover. I remember seeing the other tribes walking somewhere together with Ken's other men. There were different camps, but some stayed south where we originally were, 
a few weeks prior. But I did see so much people traveling. We could have been millions. As a young servant, I began to do chores for except cooking and hunting. Male survivors like me weren't permitted to learn combat. However, one thing really surprised me. When I was working, I saw Ken having the roughest time with one of the more recent concubines from our last stop, a girl named Yue. She came from that same place where we stopped for animal covers. And there was a huge river there as well that crossed the entire country. We filled our water supply and other things apart from Ken's search for wives. Yue was beautiful and she looked so fragile. But I truly believe Yue almost killed Ken that day. Even though Ken saw her as a playful joke, I witnessed her movements and she moved like a killer. She even pinned him to the ground a few times. I would say, how can somebody so small like Yue pinch such a massive warrior like Ken? We finally reached a place in the north of the huge river close to the mountains, where we settled and there Ken creates a brutal society enslaving us in his different settlements. Some were next to the mountains, but us from Ken's camp were closer to the colder plains. It was Ken and his men. This was the place of their favorite megafauna meat, and they were many. I saw 30 of Kansas men take down some of these massive creatures easily and some would only use their hands. When Ken and his men left to hunt, I took the opportunity to speak with Yue. I would walk freely along his camp cause the queen was my mother. I tried to speak with Yue, but she couldn't understand me. So I used hand signs and emotions. Yue understood perfectly the first time and agreed to train me, where I experienced pain like I've never imagined possible. Yue was my friend. Her training broke me and even almost all my bones. The things she would be able to do seemed like magic. She could kill any of Kenzie's warriors if she really wanted to. She taught me to stay skinny to hide my abilities. I couldn't get fat even if I really wanted to anyways. I was thin as a twig just like Yue. In two months, I had already became very strong and skilled from working very hard. I wanted to end Ken, but I was still too small and weak to face the likes of a warrior around 8 cubits in height. I wasn't enough, at least not yet. At this same time, I'm 8 years old. A few weeks later from that, I find myself with a baby brother named Toro. Toro was very heavy and almost as big as I was, and my mom was later expecting another. The settlements were now villages with a hierarchical society. In a year, our language was getting influences from U.S.'s people my own people, and Kansas men. The more fluent ones were the children of Kansas warriors. Even as time passed, I grew even more hate for Ken and his men. Sometimes I couldn't wait to execute my plan. I missed my best friend, my father, and my old life. Why were we ever thrown into this cold hell in the first place? A few years passed and I'm already 14. I work every day with shores and still train every night in secret. Our village traded some goods and a lot of nations were trying to invade Ken. Ken always kept them at bay with his massive body and his bigger reputation for war. My brother, Toro, was already almost as tall as me and he was only six, but he was becoming a great hunter. Apparently, Ken's peoples are born warriors. Yue also had a baby from Ken. One day, Ken decides to seek new women I had heard they found the next queen for Ken. As my mother, even though beautiful as she was, she was still reaching the age of 30 in a few years. This was one of the things that I mostly hated about Ken, apart from all the suffering he put us through. Like always, we could do nothing. I only needed three more years to reach a greater potential where I could be a little bigger and more prepared. But I was already secretly among the best warriors in Ken's settlement of thousands of people. When they bring women, they bring them from the two main sources. Some from U.S.'s people and the others from my own confederation of tribes who are tormented by these warrior men. We all witness their arrivals. Some girls are from our local village, the one where Kansas camp resides. Absolutely gorgeous women tied with ropes begin to walk in the camp with the guards. There I saw her. It was my best friend who I thought could have been dead from all the chaos. It was her. It was my best friend from before we were exiled. It's Cuba. As I see Cuba, I can tell the distress in her face and I know she doesn't want to marry Ken. She sees me and for a second her emotions change and she gave me a soft look. 
of relief that I was alive. I felt the same way as my tears went down. She then changes her look away because of what is about to happen. The young women were taken straight into Kansas' tent. I started to tremble in anger and to breathe erratically. My mother knew, so she touched me in the back. But I walked away trying to remain calm. It wasn't my time yet, but I didn't want Cuba to walk in that tent. I couldn't control my jealousy, which made me run towards the guards, and I took out three that were nearest to Cuba. I break the ropes from Cuba and picked her up and tried to run away with her. In the commotion, Ken is self-alerted and jumps from within the tent and tumbles my running so I fall. He grabs onto Cuba and I try to pull her away, but he surprised me by stabbing me in the chest with a small dagger he had inside his robe. I start to bleed so much that my vision for a moment began to fade. I was going to die again like that time I was seven. I ruined my seven year long plan. I can fight him, but his soldiers were close and he was thrown his spear. But when he threw the spear with his blinding anger at me to kill me, my mother jumps on the spear and is severely impaled by it and falling onto the floor. I've never felt such anger upon then. My heart sunk so low, it was hard to breathe even. I walked slowly towards my mother. She tried to tell me something, and I hold her hand, not knowing what to do to help. She's fighting to stay alive. She tells me, Don't worry. It's an honor to die for my young, strong man. It's okay. You did the right thing. Whatever happens, it will be fine. Just stay alive. Come back another day and retrieve Cuba. Now go, leave! Kansas men run to detain me, but he stops them and tells me to exile the village. I turn around and run away as fast as I can. With my peripheral vision, I can see Ken walking slowly towards my mother with low shoulders. The guards notice too, so they become silent. As I run for 30 leagues away from the camp, all I can see is the lights of the campfires. And then I heard the loudest gut-wrenching roar that I have ever heard from Ken. So angry and so mighty, I could see the shadow of birds and animals scare off away. At that second, I had no doubt in my mind my mother died most likely in Ken's arms. I was angry, but so deeply sad. My adrenaline kept me going. If not, I would have fainted any second. And I had ice on my chest to stop the bleeding. I ran for what it felt a full day while crying for mother. And for the sake of my own sanity, I had to remove Cuba entirely from my mind. Lest I not done so, I really would have turned back, which would have ended with my life, defeating the purpose of all sacrifices made. This was the hardest decision in my life. I began to slowly faint, but I fight it. I need to keep my distance from Ken. I still knew I was too close. I fell down next to a pine tree within the forest and faint, not knowing what would happen. When I wake up, I'm relieved I'm still alive. It's actually slightly warmer, but I wasn't sure where I was. Immediately a group entered my tent. They were just like Jue. They said they knew who I was. They even brought peoples from my tribe. Boys just like me, who were able to escape from Ken. But these were trained just like Yue. All of them were incredible and actually better than me. But they all reminded me of exactly how good Yue was and that I was found next to the great river just south. I was confused now, but how? It takes three days by foot unless you have a horse and I only ran for a day. They said it was Yue who brought me to the great river and told me that Yue is actually a secret weapon who was born and raised to finish with Ken and his men, to avenge thousands that died who are from the great river and that that was her only purpose. Now. It all made sense to me. I stayed with them for three months, healing and perfecting my skills. I was already 15 and a half, and my obsession made me become the strongest and fastest warrior of all the villages. My new group knew my drive was a special force that would advance further our plans. So even though they were calculated leaders, they respected my resolve. So when I healed and was fully ready, I mobilized them just northeast of Kansas camp and created a hard-to-reach headquarter if we were ever going to need to retreat.